So nice to be here on retreat and so nice to be on retreat with all of you on Zoom and those of you in the city center, those of you here out at our beautiful, verdant, sticky prairie farm area of Western Wisconsin. And, um, you know, in our practice, like most religious spiritual traditions, you know, we try to, and just the very nature of our mind, we, the mind is always abstracting our experience, basically creating a, a symbol so that we don't have to be connected to the aliveness, the wildness of the present moment. We have this idea, oh, I'm on retreat, you know, and that concept, that abstraction sort of holds. So in early Buddhism, especially, <clears throat> you know, we have statues like you see of our the Buddha, our teacher, and other teachers in our lineage, and we have other symbols that represent to us, hopefully, if, they, if they're effective spiritual icons, they represent to our heart something that's alive and can't really be reduced to an idea or a word or a symbol, but still we need them, right, to communicate and either and even to just help keep something in mind. And in early Buddhism, especially our real devotional object, the, the thing, for lack of a better word, that gets us on our knees and wants to put our head down or whatever your physical gesture might be of respect, of gratitude, is reality. That's, that's our teacher, the way it is, Dhamma. But you know, in Buddhism, we have symbols for Buddha. We have symbols for Sangha. You know, often it's the monastic robes, that kind of wise community of spiritual friends symbolized by the monastic community. Not that, you know, the monastic community is always ideal, but that's the, you know, symbol. The Dhamma, this third jewel, third refuge, that is easily captured by symbol because it's really this, this lived experience moment by moment doesn't lend itself to abstraction. <laughs> but you probably get a sense from the instructions that Shelley gave and I have been giving that, you know, we're directing ourselves back, we're cultivating a, val a valuing, and, and even more important, uh, we're cultivating a capacity to be interested and to sense like to cut through the symbols and abstractions and ideas and interpretation into this, again, for lack of a better phrase, non-conceptual reality. It's not that we don't have concepts about it. <laughs> Obviously, we do. The Buddha talked about it for 45 years. And then countless other people since then, right? And it really comes down to what I was trying to get at in the guided meditation. You know, we meet our teacher, so we stabilize the posture and stabilize the mind as best we can. As one teacher put it, you know, we do our best to uncover some natural ease in our posture, whether we're standing or sitting or lying down or walking. We try to do the same, compose the mind as best we can. So it has some basic natural ease or stability. And then naturally, 
with the ease of the body and the mind, the stability of the body and the mind. Naturally, the mind, but we, you know, we're encouraged, but naturally the mind will be sensitive, will be alert to whatever disturbs that natural ease and stability, that natural presence, sensitivity. And it's sort of like um, every time, every moment, who basically, like a, a good Dharma student, every moment they're fascinated, interested, curious about anything that looks like a personal problem. No matter what the supporting causes for that arising, you know, it might be a painful memory, it might be something exciting that you're speculating about in the future. Oatmeal for breakfast. <laughs> so whatever it might be. And then there's the mind is taking something personally. And there's a personal problem, a personal something to resolve or to take care of. Or, and it's like out of this, you know, relatively speaking, out of this basic ease of just being, there arises this problem. And the difference between a normal person who's not practicing and someone who's trying to follow the teachings of the Buddha is we get interested. That's interesting. As opposed to, no, this is a problem. Let me take care of this problem. And then I'll get back to my natural ease or stability. Almost like uh, interested in that magical arising that Boy, it really seems there's a me who has a problem or a me who wants something or a me who wants, I mean, we want to really acknowledge how vivid, how real that seems. I mean, some of you shared that in our small group today. And I know we all know this experience. Our personal problems seem very real. <laughs> and, and it's in a way insulting and we never should do this, is tell somebody that their personal problems aren't real. I'm not saying that to you. I'm just saying it's kind of interesting when we have some basic ease, some basic peacefulness, some basic contentedness with conditions, how quickly something can arise in that space. And what we often also don't notice is how quickly what appears, what has appeared and maybe was even stable for a while to be a big problem can cease. I mean, this is a good time, second day, second full day of a nine day retreat to just be honest with ourselves how many, many or not so many storms showed up today you know, whatever kind of drama it might have been. And in the middle of it, when the mind, <coughs> excuse me, was identified, seemed very real, very personal. The mind was relating sort of with that attitude that I can't practice until I resolve this. I have to pee. I can't really practice until I take care of this pain in my bladder and then I'll get back to my practice or whatever it might be. I don't have my readers. <laughs> you know, I can. And uh, what you've heard uh, three of us say over and over is that uh, as my one of my early teachers, um, my first three month one of my first three month teachers at uh, Inset Meditation Society said pretty regularly, you know, mindfulness doesn't care what's arising. It's just another thing in the forest, just the next thing showing up, arising out of past causes. And the interesting thing isn't what so much is arising, although we want to meet it, we want to be interested. But what's even more interesting than what's showing up, 
a memory, something in the room, a strange sound in the room. So it could be internal or external, right? But what's actually interesting from the point of view of suffering and freedom from suffering is how the mind relates to that. How the mind's perceiving it, how the mind is thinking about it, how the mind is viewing it, taking it personally, not relating to it with greed, hatred, and delusion, the grip of aversion, the burning of desire, the net of delusion, the Buddha said, or the opposite. You know, so instead of the grip of aversion, the release of loving kindness, of being kind. Kindness ultimately, at least from the Buddhist point of view, is the absence of ill will in the heart. Instead of the burning of desire, the coolness of contentedness. Instead of the confusing net of delusion, the clarity of seeing things as they are, seeing the naturalness of causes and conditions coming and going lawfully, naturally. So how to stay alert to what arises to disturb our ease. And you know, there's so many of these chicken and egg conundrums in our spiritual life, like it would be totally appropriate for one of us to say, well, sure, I could be interested in what arises to disturb my natural ease if I had any, <laughs> but how can I see what's disturbing ease in the mind when I don't feel really that at ease. I'm not that stable. So we need ease to see clearly, but we also need to see clearly to find some stability, find some ease, find some well-being, find ways to be safe enough in our environment and our particular, what's like available to us, you know, as we navigate our retreats. And that's, we're, we're doing both of those things. We're doing our best to not, um, we want to be interested in the ease that is there. We don't want to presume there isn't any stability and ease or presume there isn't any sense of well-being, like you might check right now. It's so easy to notice in the, the ways in which the heart is discontent. But like, when's the last time we actually, there was just a natural interest in the ways the heart in this moment is content, is okay with the way it is. I mean, I don't know how it is because it will be different for each of us, but I can tune into a lot of aspects of the present moment that are really okay. And if I keep those in mind, it builds the feeling of contentedness. It may not be what we want, like the particular situation each of us has right now. You might want to be home in bed or with your loved ones or whatever. But we just check, you know, with the experience of hearing, can I be content with these sounds? Is it okay? Can I be okay with the visual experiences I'm seeing? Can I be okay with the senses, uh, the sensations rather, that the body is sensing? Can I relax with them? Can I trust them, feel safe enough with them? The smells and tastes, how about those? Content enough with the smells and tastes? And how about with the mental activity coming and going?
I'm sure most of you have heard this or read this, but it it just makes so much sense and just uh, another way that existence and human existence is a setup. So one of the things that has been figured out by people who study evolution and just the way it is, you know, but in a more scientific, Western scientific sense, is that uh, it helps in the evolutionary process to be obsessed about threats, <laughs> you know, so because it makes the creature like you or you and me more vigilant. If I'm always wondering like what could happen because it stimulates preparation, you know, so I'm going to put more money in the bank or buy a bigger car or, you know, stop doing things that are risky or wear a mask when you don't have an immune system or whatever it might be. But the, the trouble with that tendency that gets developed, you know, through evolution is that uh, we don't survive in the end anyway. And it, it, it reinforces this wrong idea that well-being is like perfectly correlated with survival. But they're actually two different things. Well-being, freedom, release is not the same as eking out every last second of life before the body dies or whatever, you know, the alternative would be. So this is uh, the reason I bring this up is just to remind us that a practice isn't easy for this reason, because we have this conditioning to kind of keep getting safe instead of honestly, it's almost like widening the lens. In what ways might there be enough safety now? Not that the conditions I'm experiencing are perfectly trustworthy, but are they trustworthy enough? Like, and we just, this is not something we figure out cognitively, we actually experiment. Like, is it okay to relax? So we practice, as I talked about the first night, we practice valuing relaxation, softening, trusting, allowing, not theoretically like, oh, life is really here to protect me. But in this moment, for just this moment, one moment at a time, can I really trust life, this, whatever we want to call this? Put down the guard, the armor, the aggressive stance. And just, we just try. I mean, it's just like simple, observation like well how does that work like when i do that what does what does that set in motion i mean people have found their own ways to do this i think somebody in our group mentioned but this is very common um but just using imagination well what what would the buddha how would the buddha go through the food line here at the retreat center or how would uh you know buddha brush their teeth or how would my person that I see as a wise teacher handle this difficult memory that's showing up? But it's just a clever way, it's just another way, because of course, there isn't some Buddha or teacher out there that's gonna save us. That's not how it works. It's a great line in Buddhism, in the Buddhist tradition, you know, the Buddhas, the, the wise, beings, they've done their work. Now it's our turn. All the Buddhas, all the wise teachers can do is point the way. That's why common ground, you know, way back when in the early years, we adopted the footprints as a kind of graphic for the center because it's just um, acknowledgement and of a gratitude appreciation for there are footprints to follow. You know, there's a path 
not just the Buddha, but so many folks who had human minds <laughs> like us, complicated lives, maybe in some ways more complicated, you know, who knows? We don't really know. But what we know is human beings have been walking this path. We're not alone. It's well, well worn. And what in our tradition makes the Buddha special isn't even that he discovered the path, right? The Buddha was very clear about this. I didn't discover this path. I cleared the path. That path was there. It just had gotten overgrown through lack of use. And that sort of clearing the path is like seeing how that path looked in his own life and articulating it. And, you know, the interesting thing when you study, like I don't study so much, uh, I'm not a poly scholar, but, you know, when you study the people who are poly scholars, they just see how the Buddha got better, not about his enlightenment, his awakening, his understanding, but better at articulating it through those 45 years that he was teaching. Like how to clear the path, how to help people understand there's a way to practice. There's a way to train our heart, our mind. And it really comes to this place of how the mind is relating. There's a very famous story that I like to tell. A lot of you have heard me tell it, but it's one of the better known suttas, partly because it involves a lay person, chitta which is the Pali word for heart, mind, but that was the person's name, Chitta. He was a lay person and he was quite devoted to the Buddhist teachings and a really good practitioner, had some deep insight um, that surpassed a lot of the you know, nuns and monks who were practicing as monastics. But anyway, I, he'd, the, the general rhythm was the monks and nuns would get up and as soon as they could see the lines on their hands, right? Because they didn't have timepieces. That was allowable to walk into town, gather some food in their bowl. Then they'd come together, you know, having walked through the villages, gotten enough to eat, sit down. They'd usually eat together, clean up their bowls, and then they'd have Dharma discussions. And then after that, they'd go to their own little camp or kuti or platform and practice through the afternoon and evening, into, well into the night, if they were, you know, a sincere practitioner. But there was always Dharma discussions after the meal, after they cleaned the bowls. And the lay people sometimes would come to hear the discussions. And so uh, Chitta showed up and the monks were discussing this, this issue, like, uh, you know, basically, what's the problem with human existence? Because, gosh, it hurts <laughs> being human. You know, it's hard. And so some of them evidently were arguing, well, the trouble is that we're sensitive. We see stuff, we hear stuff, we think stuff, we feel stuff in our bodies. We're just, we, there's this tremendous exposure that comes with being human. And then, you know, stereotypically, the other half of the monks were arguing, no, 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 it's not that we're sensitive. The problem is that the sense experience isn't nice enough. Right? You don't want to get rid of your sensitivity, you know, close your eyes, plug your ears, somehow numb your skin, dull your thinking mind. What you want is to somehow get nicer experiences. So they were arguing about this and they saw Chitta there and they recognized him as being, you know, a respected student and practitioner. So they asked him his opinion. So this is a little unusual that where the, uh, a lay person gets to be the star of these kind of stories. And Chitta had this great response. And often, you know, they would, people would use similes. So he said, imagine there's a, a black ox and a white ox, and they're tied together with this, you know, those wooden yokes that would hold the oxen together so that they could pull a cart or something like that. And then he asked, is it right to say that the black ox is a fetter, a burden on the white? or that the white is a burden on the black. And they, you know, the monks were smart enough to say, no, it's not that one is oppressing the other. The problem is this collar or yoke that ties them together. That's the problem. And so Chitta uses that as a teaching. He says, yeah, that's exactly how it is in our mind too. You know, 
one of the oxen <clears throat> is sensitivity and the other is what we're sensitive to what's arising in our you know the through the six sense gates that i talked about earlier in the retreat the only way we sense the world through thoughts and emotions and the five senses that's how we know things so it's neither the sensitivity to those six things know what's a, nor what's arising through those six sense gates the problem is something arises in conjunction with that and in buddhism we call that ignorance you know like that wrong understanding and that wrong understanding arises in the connection between being sensitive to sense experience you know we talked <clears throat> shelley talked about buddha and Dhamma as two of the three refuges on Saturday night. And, uh, you know, Buddha is that quality of being awake. So that's like sensitivity. And Dhamma or Dharma is like what's arising, is the nature of what's coming and going. <laughs> and when that is free of ignorance, not misunderstood, the being sensitive to what's being known, right? This is being known. Some of you have heard me say, and this is often how uh, one of my teachers, Saito Tejaniya, would uh, talk about it. Like, oh yeah, it's something being known. Same with Ajahn Sumedho. would often use something like that. There's always uh, something, an object, something is arising and it's being known. And it's not like they're two different things even. What's important is that we can notice, we can sense the two. There is an experience and it's being known and we're learning to let that be really simple. And the way we let that be really simple is we notice what doesn't help. And that's where the, the hindrances come in. Like when there's a version in that collar between the sensitivity and the experience being sensed and there's aversion and now there's a person being mindfully aware we see how that bur that aversion is like a 50 pound bag of rocks it doesn't need to be carried it doesn't help me navigate unpleasant experience being averse doesn't help us navigate unpleasant experience really wanting a cabin, a perfect cabin in the woods or on a lake, really the wanting of it doesn't manifest it in any way. It just makes the heart tight. It's an unnecessary 50 pound bag of rocks. So wanting and not wanting. The Buddha likens these, you know, wanting is like the mind is colored with that dye. Right? It's shaped by that promise, if only, that I'll be happy. And he talks about it as being in depth. So when you're, when you realize, like, and maybe you've seen this today where you had some desire, I just need to, I just want to lie down or, you know, I can't wait till the weather changes. But when that desire pops, when the mind, for whatever reason, drops that obsession with the wanting, it's like being out of debt. I'm not in debt to that promise that I can't be happy until I get that, have that. And then he likens not wanting to a kind of illness. You know, we're afflicted when we're raging or hateful or fearful. And it's like all of these five hindrances, they're, they're all, they are their own vortex, whirlpool, right? There's a kind of naturalness to how the mind stays caught <laughs> in it and how like even when there's a little wisdom you know we're sort of a little bit aware like how oh, this is unhelpful not going anywhere but it's just like yeah but <laughs> it's the yeah but <laughs> that just brings us right back and it's really about unwise attention as the buddha would say because it's like in that moment where we're sensing like, oh yeah, this little obsession isn't helpful, 
there's a, a choice that we normally don't see until we start to practice. What am I going to pay attention to in that moment? And if I pay attention to the, well, what about, you know, and go back to the provocative image. So like with desire, it's like bringing up the thing that the mental image or the mental idea of what I really like about whatever the obsession is, right? It's like dangling the carrot and the mind grabs it again. Because I could bring to mind, yeah, yeah, that nice cabin would be nice, but then I'd have to rake or, you know, I'd have to replace the roof or eventually the septic system's going to go out and who's going to pay the property taxes and what happens if I have an obnoxious neighbors? Or what happens if there's, God forbid, algae in the lake? That's what I noticed because I do. I mean, this is a, unfortunately, somewhat of an obsession of mine. <laughs> Mostly, I see it as entertainment, but it's really not. It's it's really torture in a way. But there it is. This is how our mind works. But it's like uh, you know, it's never ending with whatever it is, whether it's about a partner, about fixing your body, or becoming somebody in your life that you want to become. So with practice, you know, when there's that stability of wisdom and awareness and we see the unnecessary weight of craving, of wanting, then it's like being free from debt because it falls away. Seeing the unnecessariness of wanting is the cause for it dropping away. Not wanting to stop wanting, <laughs> that's more wanting. You, we actually have to see it up close and personal. That's why it's hard work. Same with aversion. When we see the unworkableness of aversion, how it's not for my well-being, the well-being of others, or the well-being of anyone, we keep seeing that with patience, then the mind drops. It's, it weakens the tendency to, be, to relate with aversion. Same with dullness and restlessness, two other pairs that afflict us on retreat and all life long, right? Too little and too much energy. And the Buddha likens too little energy, like a mind full of algae, thick, right? And when we uh, are free, it's like walking out of prison when we're no longer. And it's like, can we be... Like, how do we brighten the mind where we get interested in something? I mean, there's one thing when you're sleepy because you just didn't get enough sleep. I'm talking about how the mind uses sleep to escape being present. So it's just like how to bring brightness in, including being interested in sleepiness itself. But this is interesting. It's like heavy, heavy, heavy. You know, and it's so interesting just getting interested in sleepiness can actually completely change the mind. But, you know, there are other ways too. Opening the eyes, bringing more light in, standing, doing more mindful movement versus less sitting. Yeah, it sort of depends. And with restlessness, he likens it to uh, a pond whipped up by the wind. You know, so it's not clear. And uh, it's like uh, freed from enslavement. Because, you know, when we're restless, we're often restless about some mistake we've made, some remorse we have, some worry we have spinning in that way. And it is like being enslaved. Like, I can't go on until this gets resolved. And then the last one is doubt the muddiness of a mind, right? That's how the simile the Buddha uses. And when we dispel doubt, it's like stepping out of danger. And when the Buddha talked about how we feed and how we find a way out of these hindrances, that would hinder that stability, that clarity of the mind, it's really about wise attention. So it isn't a 
like a special key that unlocks the mind when it's trapped in one of these hindrances. It's really this wise discernment. How is the mind relating? There's a sensitive heart being sensitive to whatever's arising in the moment and something's arising in conjunction between the sensitivity that the heart mind has and whatever it is that the mind heart is knowing. Something, some view, some attitude is arising there. Can I get interested in it? That's the key to discern or get interested in how the mind is relating without trying to fix it. We're just trying to see the skillfulness or the unskillfulness of how the mind is relating. So you can drop that question into your practice. How's the mind? Okay, there's sense, uh, the heart sensitive to what? The heart sensitive to this. And so then this is how it is. That's the sensitivity being sensitive to this. So that's how it is now for me. It's like this. So how's the mind relating? How's the mind relating? And that, that sort of sharpens the interest like, oh yeah, it's relating in a way that's like 50 pounds of rocks. And we just have to be patient, just keep seeing like, oh yeah, this isn't helpful. Because it's the seeing that it's not helpful that is the cause for the release. Not some volitional, stop doing that, Mark. That doesn't do it. If it did, we would have put down all of our bad habits long ago because most of us at least have had glimpses of what are bad habits. But they're there, right? Because we have to really kind of penetrate with the stability the kindness, the patience of, you know, wisdom and awareness, we have to, uh, we have to penetrate until we see, oh yeah, there's a, this way of relating really isn't for my well-being or anybody's well-being. And we see it and we see it, it's like collecting data. Eventually there's enough data and the mind lets go. But we can't force it, can't speed it up. That's why the Buddha says, and I'll end with this, you know, he says, patience is the supreme incinerator of the defilements. <laughs> That's at least one person's translation. Sometimes it's translated as the supreme austerity, but I like the supreme incinerator of the defilements, right? Just that. And to really feel it, sense it as a superpower, like, I don't know much, but I am capable of discerning there is sensitivity, being sensitive to this, this is how it is, and I am capable of being curious, how is the mind, how is the heart relating now? Is it helpful or is it unhelpful? And then we just patiently observe because it's that continuity that will reveal if it's helping or not. And that's, you see, that marriage there of wisdom and compassion. So let's let go of the words. Just take a few moments of silence before we do our walking practice. We have about 25 minutes for walking and for those of you who are driving home from the city center, feel free to join the sit a few minutes late if you have to. And we'll do some chanting together and sit and join in if it makes sense. I know some of you on the East Coast, it may not make sense, but and we'll come back in a little bit.
Welcome back. Let's chant the Buddha's words on loving kindness before we move into our sit. Now let us chant the Buddha's words on loving kindness. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties, and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm, and wise and skillful, not proud and demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove. Wishing in gladness and in safety, may all beings be at ease, whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease, let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another, even as a mother protects with her life her child, her only child. So with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings, radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, free from hatred and ill will, whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection, this is said to be the sublime abiding by not holding to fixed views, the pure hearted one having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires is not born again into this world.
for another good day of practice, everyone. Wishing you good rest. We'll see hopefully some of you for the 6.30 set in the morning. <laughs>